Well, thank you, Scott, um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, what a great uh, auditorium this, and I think if we had facilities like this, we probably wouldn't have had the need to start the core <laughs> uh, back then. And it's nice of you all to make it. Um, I note, noted the hungover uh, remark, Scott. My son is here, who's a senior, and I'm hoping he's not in that condition. He, he didn't report to me on what was going on last night, but I'm glad to see he drug himself out of bed to, to come here and join, join all, all of you. Um, and my, Mike referred to it as ragtag, and uh, it certainly was when you consider what we went through uh, and, and how this university looks today and how, how much you've done with the Corp. I have to tell you, I saw the photo of all of you standing, or many of you in the room, I assume, were in the photo on that poster standing on uh, Healy Steps and uh, uh, just was blown away, you know, by how many people now are affected here and by what you've done with, with the Corp over all of these years. So it's fun for me to come back and, and meet all of you and, and talk to you. You do not want to hear uh, 45 minutes from me, so I'm going to promise not to go that long and hoping maybe we can stop at some point and take questions uh, if, if, uh, if there are some. Um, I wanted to, uh, I thought the best way maybe to organize the few minutes that I'll speak to you is probably around three lessons, having gone to a Catholic University. I, all, I learned all things must come in threes, you know, the Trinity, and you know, you can't have four, and two is never enough. So we came up with three lessons that, uh, and with each of them, I'll probably pepper them with a little bit of a story uh, that will give you a sense of how some of these, these things started. But first, just before the three lessons, a little bit of a word on, on the history. And I'm sorry I wasn't able to make Roger Cacchetti's um, uh, I don't know how many of you were at the reception last night, but Roger uh, gave the toast and I understand spoke a little bit about uh, his uh, coming out with the guide with everyone's social security numbers and all of the stories of, of how the thing uh, began. Um, so I hope I don't repeat too much of what he said about the very beginning. It started in 72 as my first year, first year here and it really was born of an era when we were all questioning authority. I mean, this was still, the Vietnam War was, was still going on. Kissinger was in Paris, engaged in, uh, in peace negotiations. Richard Nixon was in the White House. George McGovern uh, had just been nominated the Democratic nominee. Um, you've seen all the pictures, I'm sure. Students were retreating, literally retreating onto Georgetown's campus to escape uh, the riot police that were stopped at the gates at 37th Monroe. Um, it was a time of the SDS had a little bit, uh, SDS was Students for a Democratic Society, which would today be classified, I'm sure, as a terrorist organization, <laughs> close to Al-Qaeda. They, uh, they had a townhouse about three townhouses down from the front gate on the left. They owned a townhouse and had their headquarters there. So this in many ways was an epicenter for a lot of the student activism that was going on at the time. Fortunately, at Georgetown, we didn't burn down buildings like they did at places like University of Wisconsin and Madison and others, but you have to kind of imagine the time when tear gas was all over the front lawn and riot police with helmets and kids running and camped out in tents uh, on the, you know, surrounding the Carroll statue. It was a pretty amazing, pretty amazing time. And of that time was born this corporation, as much, frankly, as a political statement as it was a business enterprise. Students of Georgetown, Inc. was something that uh, the early founders, Roger and others, really, and Doug Kellner, by the way, well, I don't know if Doug has been mentioned or he was here. Doug was my predecessor and was very important to, to those early days. Uh, but they themselves were real activists, and they um, questioned, we, we felt very free to question authority here at Georgetown. I remember uh, once when we were upset about rising tuition, we backed up a, a truck load of, a dump truck load of lemons, and uh, literally uh, dumped them all on the stairs in front of Healy, and then took baskets of them and dumped them in front of the president's office up on the second floor and sat outside of his office, had a sit-in for I think a couple of days until they finally <laughs> kicked us out. Nobody got arrested. Uh, but uh, uh, that was, you know, that was what was going on. And, and when I, um, I, I ran for uh, 
um, I don't know what you call it now, student. It was student body president back then, but I ran, I ran my sophomore year, um, primarily because Doug uh, and Roger uh, had wanted me to. I was involved in the, in the corp. Um, I don't know what my title was, but my freshman year, and they thought it would be a good idea to run your sophomore year, which is a year earlier than you normally do. And, and my platform was really all around the corporation. And the corp was something at the time that um, a number of us felt um, could, you know, move beyond. It, it, we already had a number of things like a travel service and a record store and a few other things, but that could really address, um, as as Mike was saying, address social uh, so needs on campus that were not uh, that were not being addressed. And I was very, I mean, I was really fortunate to have. Some of you may have seen the. Um, the tape that's on, on the, some Georgetown site of, of Bud Colligan and myself talking about those early days. Bud was one of my best friends, remains one of my dear friends, uh, and went on, had a very successful career in technology. Uh, but he, you know, there's always got to be, and I'm sure there is in the corp today, those, you know, real stalwarts who work the long hours and make sure it happens and are so totally dedicated. and. Bud was that kind of partner of mine who really should get most of the credit, I think. And I mean, he was the one who literally, for Vital Vittles, it was our friend Nancy who came up with the name Vital Vittles and wrote it on the back of a piece of cardboard. And, uh, and Bud was the one who got a pickup truck and went down to some library that was being dismantled in DC somewhere and got a bunch of old wooden uh, bookcases and brought them up and we stacked them with Oreo cookies and a few other things and opened up in New South. What, we then called Vital Vittles, and that was the first day, and it was Bud who went out and bought the Oreo cookies from Stop and Shop or someplace around here, and we just <laughs> sold them at no profit, and eventually had a little, had a little you know, metal box that we kind of kept and hope, hope that nobody took any beer money out, and that's kind of how the, how the whole thing started. So the three lessons, I'll tell you, and I'll give you some stories around them, and, and boy, they are about as basic um, and and simplistic as you'll ever hear, so you're not gonna have to take any notes, um, and you certainly aren't gonna get any blinding insights, but they're kind of good basic <laughs> lessons in life. And the first one, which I've already referred to, is you know, don't accept the status quo. Um, you know, you, uh, and Mike, Mike referred to this when he said services no one else will offer, we had, um, travel agency, we had a record store. The thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is the two more controversial ones, which were Vital Vittles and then the pub, which I guess you don't have, but we actually for a while, because the drinking age was 18 then, fortunately, it was 21 in Virginia, so you had to drink here. Uh, and we opened up in the, in the basement of Healy for a while, a pub which basically consisted of a keg of beer and some plastic cups. And again, the, probably the same little metal box that was used over at Vital Vittles at night went over to the, <laughs> to the, to the pub. Uh, and then we had Vital Vittles uh, across the way in New South, and there was a guy named Dick McCooey. Mm, you probably don't know Dick, but there are probably some of those of you I hear, see are smiling. Dick, Dick was really a power, I don't know what ever happened to Dick. Did Dick pass away? Because I know he no longer, he has. So I, can, so I can talk about him without being sued, maybe, unless by the estate. But Dick was really... <laughs> Dick was really the, uh, I mean, he was this kind of power, you know, he was, if there was the Wizard of Oz and the little guy behind the, you know, the curtain, that was Dick McCooey, okay? It was somebody who was really controlling everything outside of the university's walls, and that was Dick. And Dick owned 1789, he owned the Tombs, he owned Fitzgerald's, and he owned Weissmuller's. And so he, like, owned everything. You know, we had no choice. And this is, by the way, don't accept the status quo. I mean, Dick had a monopoly on all of us. He charged whatever he wanted to charge. And you can imagine his reaction when this bunch of kids, you know, opened up a competing, something competing with the tombs, the only thing that was within two, three miles, of, you know, otherwise you had to go to third edition or something to get a, to, <laughs> to get a beer. Uh, and, and Vital Vittles, which was a direct competitor to Weismuller's at the time, where, you know, he, again, it was the only place where you could get Oreo cookies if you wanted them, at, you know, and they didn't even stay open very late. Um, and he was a very reserved gentleman. I mean, he was actually a really nice kind of guy, but he, but we thought, you know, we, 
he had horns as far as we were concerned because he was ripping us off. And uh, all of a sudden one day I got a call and, and it was from Mr. McCooey and he said, uh, how would you like to have dinner at 1789? And I said, uh, sure. I, I'd never been in 1789. I could, n I could never have afforded 1789. I don't think I had a tie or a jacket. And of course one was required so maybe Mr. McCooey gave me one for the night. And, he sat down and he started to give me, and I think he felt that, uh, you know, that he could intimidate me, and, and uh, he wasn't threatening or anything, but he made it very clear that he wasn't wild about this pub and, and vital vittles, and, and that in fact, uh, he didn't want to, but he would give consideration to suing the university because the university was violating, violating its tax exempt status. Uh, because we weren't, we were operating on university property, we were a nonprofit, so we weren't violating any tax policy that I know of, um, but he claimed the university was because the university's, this was the university's property, they were running commercial enterprise and they weren't having to pay city taxes and sales taxes and real estate taxes and all the other things that Dick, you know, said I have to pay in order to compete. So I listened and I was very polite and he was very polite and uh, I thought for sure he, he would sue us and he apparently decided not to and we, we escaped for the moment the threat of, of, of Dick McCooey. But at the time, and, and this is something I think, you know, later in life you'll come across a lot, um, you know, you'll come across things that you want to do and there'll be bigger powers that will have their own reason to want to stop you and uh, don't get intimidated by that. Um, press forward. Do what you think. Uh, do what you think you should do, and don't don't accept the status quo. And not accepting the status quo, I think, was really the one, the number one lesson that led to the formation originally of the court. The second one is um, uh, to create your own, and all these are kind of related, but to create your own opportunities. And I think the best story for that was guts, where, uh, and the genesis of that really was the. Um, probably the purchase or rental, whatever the university did with St. Albans, with, with Albans Towers. I don't know if that's still part of Georgetown or not. not. At the time, we had, as you do now, I think, um, I know this from my own son who's here, you've got, you know, still a real housing shortage. At the time, it was a real housing shortage. I think you were only guaranteed your freshman year. Uh, and so they, the school, in order to try to relieve some of this, um, rented out or bought, I can't remember which, Alban Towers, which is right up across, right up by where the cathedral is. And it's, you know, obviously that's quite a ways from here. And a bunch of kids had to, you know, that was the only place they were going to go to live. And the bus service sucked that in terms of the DC bus service could not, for whatever reason, seem to make their way down to Georgetown University or very close by. So we decided that um, in part because of that and all the students who, because they couldn't live on campus, were spread out all over the community that we should have a bus service. We actually went to the university first and said, we'd like you to do this, and they kind of chuckled and said, no thanks, we're not in the business of bus services. Uh, and it just so happened that uh, Mercedes-Benz was interested in a contract to do the shuttle buses out at National Airport. Did any of these stories get brought up last night? Or I'm, not, I'm not boring you, am I? So they, they wanted to do the shuttle service, Mercedes-Benz out at National Airport, and uh, uh, they somehow heard, I don't know who it was, it may have been Bud, found out about this, cleverly. Um, and, uh, and David Ralston, by the way, was also very involved at that time. And David later went on to become head of, in fact, I think today, he's head of the uh, Washington Metropolitan Transit, Transportation Authority, which runs Reagan Airport. So how ironic that he would later run, run the whole thing. But they found out, and, and Mercedes, was convinced that, that we conv helped convince them that they should cut a deal with us to give us Mercedes buses. I, I mean, they didn't give them to us, but we got a very good deal on them. And they could then demonstrate, kind of use it as a demo project so that they could show the prices were right and they got the maintenance correct and da 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 da. So they could later go on and, and bid on this contract out at National Airport. So we did, we here we had all these Mercedes, brand new, gleaming, you know, Mercedes school bu uh, buses, uh, which and I don't know who came up with guts, Georgetown University Transportation Society at first, and then I guess it became system or whatever. But um, kind of like jugs, I guess, as a society, isn't it, Webb? 
So I, we were into societies back then. But it was obviously, there was a little bit of a concern about uh, um, stereotypical, you know, here these wealthy Georgetown students are all driving around in Mercedes <laughs> buses we were all, and that wasn't quite the image that we had as a corporation, but it was a really good deal for Mercedes, and so we, we that's how the, the guts bus got started. Um, so create your own opportunities. And then the last thing I'd say is, and then we can turn it over to some questions, is, is um, stand up for, for what's right. Um, I wrote down originally, by the way, stand your ground, and then I realized, oh my God, this is, stand your ground has gotten very bad connotations these days if you're reading the newspaper about what happened, so I won't say stand your ground, but, but stand up for what's, um, for what's right. There was a, and the story here has to do with uh, the Vince Lombardi Cancer Research Center. Um, the Corp, I don't know if many of you know this, and I don't think this has gone on for a while, but was a major, uh, not a, well, a fairly major funder of the, the uh, Cancer Research Center. And the way we did that was to have stage on campus in, in, in McDonough um, a professional tennis tournament. And we got Jimmy Connors and Neely Nastasi. I mean, this was a real, this was Washington, D.C.'s major professional tennis tournament, and whoever was the CEO of the Corp was the chair of the, of the tournament, and we, the Corp, ran the, ran the tournament, and all the proceeds, and they were substantial, went to um, the hospital for the, for the Vince Lombardi Cancer Research Center. And we had this going on for a couple of years at least, and uh, two gentlemen who are quite famous here in Washington and now around the world who really kind of were kind of the founders of professional tennis in many respects. A guy named Donald Dell who used to do provide commentary on, on uh, tennis and his partner Lee Fentress who owned one of the first sports marketing groups. They decided that this little, you know, pissant group from Georgetown, you know, was running this tournament they wanted to have, they were running professional tournaments in other parts of the country, they wanted Washington, D.C., they were both actually from Washington, D.C., so they wanted to have a tournament down at the Capitol Center, which was, of course, much, much bigger than Little McDonough, and they could make much more money, and they went to, at the time, in order to have a, a tennis tournament, a professional tennis tournament in a city, you had to be sanctioned by the, the United States, uh, at that time, called the USTA, the United States Tennis Association, and um, these guys who were extremely powerful in the tennis world managed to get our sanction pulled by the USTA, even though we had been running it for, for, for a number of years. And uh, this is the stand up for what, you're, you know, what you feel is right. We decided we would sue them. And we sued uh, Donald Dell. He was also representing Arthur Ashe. I mean, I think even Arthur Ashe may have been a defendant. And we sued them on violation of antitrust, uh, that the, uh, they had no right to uh, prevent us from having our tournament, that in fact the whole sanction process was a violation of antitrust. And so this blew up in the whole tennis world because we now had a lawsuit that ba went to the whole basis of how professional tennis was organized. And we did this because we thought we'd just make their lives difficult. And I had an office. <laughs> And I, I had, my office was down, I don't know where your office is now, but mine was in the basement of the Healy building. It's actually a very cool office that you had for the president of corporate. It was kind of vaulted thing. And Donald Dell, who was really a very famous guy, he was on TV all the time, and he was on the cover of Tennis Magazine, and he and Lee came into my office one day, and they were going to negotiate, you know, they were going to try to get a negotiated settlement, I guess is what you'd call it. Uh, and they, you know, they literally, Donald Dell was known as having this temper, and I can't use the words that he used repeatedly during this, you know, conversation, screaming at the top of his lungs at me, standing down there in the basement of Healy, you know, threatening all sorts of bodily harm. I even, I mean, that guy was just, he just went off the reservation, and Lee, his partner, would constantly, you know, say, Donald, settle down, settle down, and it'll be okay. They're just kids, you know, they're just kids, That's what, it'll, it'll be okay. Uh, and eventually we, eventually we settled, the USTA backed down, uh, they sanctioned uh, uh, Georgetown uh, for the tournament, uh, the other guys were defeated and they kind of had to do a deal with us a year later in what became the Volvo, Volvo tournament. But, uh, you know, just a, again a case of, of don't let people kind of push you around and, 
and stand up for what's right, and and um, and you can see how important that is in in the legacy. So I just want to I again want to congratulate all of you. I mean, you you just built something that is I think beyond the wildest dreams. Of, so I, I know one of the things you asked me to talk about is what we thought might happen. I don't think we had a clue, frankly, of what was going to happen to the corp. We did try in my years to really institutionalize it and. Obviously, I take enormous pride in seeing what you've become, but I think that's much more of what each succeeding group of students and, and leadership did um, in, in building something that's really quite special. And so um, I'm pleased to be with all of you here today, and I congratulate all of you. Thank, thanks very much.